the Harvard Graduate School of Education, working at the nexus of practice, policy, and research. I'm Steve Seidel. I'm the faculty director of the arts and education program here at the graduate, Harvard Graduate School of Education. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this Asquith Forum entitled Art, Architecture, Activism, The Sugar Hill Project. It's my privilege today to introduce this event and our three presenters, Faith Ringgold, Ellen Baxter, and David Ajay, each a master in his or her own field. And one commentator, Vera Grant, Executive du Director of the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for African and African American Research, who is here to share comments from Professor Henry Louis Gates, Jr., who at the last minute was unable to join us today. What brings us together here today is an extraordinary project that has been taking shape in New York City, specifically in Harlem, and most particularly in the Sugar Hill neighborhood of Harlem. That, that project is the Sugar Hill Project. This project, as you'll learn today, combines unusual and innovative approaches to permanent and supportive housing for the homeless and very low-income families early childhood education, and a visionary community cultural center all in one magnificent building. It has been my privilege over the last three years to meet and begin to know each of the presenters in today's forum as I've become involved with the Sugar Hill Project. My very minor involvement in the larger project has been with perhaps the most unusual dimension of this extraordinary effort, the creation of the Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling. I will let our presenters share this story and their vision of this project, and in particular, the story of the museum. What I do want to say is that this project is, from my perspective, a blending of brilliance from three critical realms of human effort, the arts, architecture, and activism, in the face of utterly unacceptable social conditions. It is a project that brings together a passion for equity and social justice with a vision of a sustainable, thriving, culturally and educationally rich community. Each of our panelists here today is a visionary who literally changes landscapes, each in his or her own unique way. Together, they are working to spark a new phase in the already incredibly rich history of the Sugar Hill neighborhood. In the process, I believe they may well change the ways we think of the place of art, storytelling, and museums in the life of a community. They will demonstrate how beautiful, inviting, and exciting housing for the homeless and low-income families can be, and they will literally change the landscape of Harlem. The format for today's forum will be to hear first from Faith Ringgold. We will then hear from Ellen Baxter and David Ajay, respectively. And then Vera Grant will share comments prepared by Professor Gates. Finally, we will close today's forum with the uh, presentation for the second time ever of the Thelma E. Goldberg Award for Excellence in Arts in Education. So, to begin. I want to introduce Faith Ringgold. I will say more about Faith at the end of the forum, but for now I simply want to say that Ms. Ringgold, born in Sugar Hill in Harlem in 1930, has had an extraordinary career as both an artist and an educator. Her groundbreaking work is in collections of major museums around the world. She has been teaching in public schools, universities, and countless other settings for her entire professional life, and she is a prolific author of books for children that have enjoyed incredible popularity ever since the publication in 1991 of her monumental work, Far Beach. Please welcome Faith Ringgold. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here to uh, to share my lifetime of work with all of you.
I became an artist in 19... Well, it's been so long ago, I've kind of forgotten it. <laughs> what the date is. Uh, I was born in 1930, at a time when art was for me something to do, not to be. It was not until I started college that I realized I wanted to be an artist. What better way was there for me to tell my story? In the 1960s, I found the images of my story unfolding before my eyes. In the 1970s and 80s, I found the words to go with the images. In the 1960s, I became a mature artist in the, uh, with the American People series and Black Light. The 1960s was a time when things changed in America and will never be the same. Much of it was for the better. However, there seems to be a continuing longing for the one step forward, two steps backward, that has been a time-worn American le legacy since the 1600s. I keep asking the question, what would life in 2011 be like without 400 years of black history in America. In the 1970s, I became a feminist, and at the same time discovered my roots in African art. I began to paint and create art specific to my identity as a black woman. I had gone to Africa to see my classical art forms and began to make dolls and masks inspired by my painting. I began to write in my art and to tell my story, not only with images, but words. And in Tonkas, story quilts and mask performances. In 1980, I made my first painted quilt, Echoes of Horror. I also completed my autobiography, but it took me 15 years to find a publisher. I then decided to create painted story quilts and the mass performances as a way to tell my story. Who's Afraid of Aunt Jemima was my first story quilt. My autobiography, We Flew Over the Bridge, The Memoirs of Faith Ringgold, was finally published by Little Brown in 1995. 15 years, and reprinted by Duke University Press in 2005. Tar Beach, coming up. Little did I know. In 1991, Random House published my first children's book, Tar Beach. Since then, I have published 15 children's books, eight with Random House, two with Disney, one with Simon & Schuster, three with HarperCollins, and one with Bunker Hill. Coming up soon is Tanner. It's a book on um, Henry Osawa Tanner. I always thought it was very important to have public works, but it's not all that easy to get a public work. You know, they could turn it down. <laughs> you know, you could offer your work for to be in a public place, but they don't have to take it. And very often, uh, they don't. However, I was invited to do this series of works for the New York public, uh, for the New York subway. And, uh, it was very, very exciting. I, I had, what's it, 25-foot mosaic murals on either side of the 125 Fifth Street IRT subway. And I, I just used all of the heroes and heroines of Harlem to illustrate my love of that neighborhood. And I had them flying over the the uh, 
the buildings that they were associated with. Uh, during this same time in the 90s, I went uh, to Paris again to uh, create the French collection. The French collection was my way of sort of paying back to my professors for all of the art that they had taught me. Uh, I didn't have very much exposure to African American artists who were living right in my neighborhood in Harlem, by the way. But now that I had found them, I could say thanks to all of the Western European artists who had shaped my uh, career as an artist because I had found myself. It's very important for an artist to find themselves to tell their own story, my story, as an African-American woman growing up in Harlem. I needed to be able to do that. And I was doing it, and a lot more. All because of so many wonderful people who had given me so much, had uh, really, made so many contributions to my career. Because as an artist, you, you just can't do anything by yourself. It is going to take many people to help you on the way to wherever it is you are going. Uh, the American collection came right after the, um, the French collection. And then more children's books. Uh, the Invisible Princess was was one of them, uh, and and I ca I can think of, you know, how engaged I was in each one of these books and the story I was telling here about the Invisible Princess who is is born in a cotton field and and magically is able to free the slaves of the village, the pa the plantation. And the, the slave master who loses all of his slaves when she does become grown. And so here he's praying to, he's going to pray to the, um, the, the, the great lady of peace to forgive him for the years of, of slavery that he imposed upon his people and to let him go to the great freedom place in the sky. And it had to be invisible because if it wasn't invisible, somebody's gonna, you know, mess with it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I made it invisible. <laughs> but these, these wonderful books um, that I was able to do are because my editors just kept, my editors at Random House and, and, the, and the different uh, places where uh, I published books just kept suggesting and suggesting that I do more and more. In 1992, Bertie and I, my husband, moved from Harlem to Englewood. I kept my Harlem house, though. I still have it. Because it formerly belonged to uh, Dinah Washington, the great jazz singer. And uh, so I kept it. But I also moved to Englewood so that I could build a studio. And this is, this is what the studio looks like in the garden and everything. I had a lot of opposition, however, from my neighbors. So it called upon me to, to exercise my right as an American to, to live where I choose. It was a bitter experience, but what I did was I took that bitter experience and I did what classically African Americans have done with music, change the bitter to the sweet, you know, the blues. And I, I made this series that goes on and on and on. Um, Coming to Jones Road is the name of it. And I just keep making those series, making myself feel better about having changed things in America through my own experience. Also, 
the Martin Luther King letter from a Birmingham jail, also something else that was given to me by uh, Sid uh, Schiff, the director of the um, limited book, uh, it's a collection of, it's a book club, and they, it's called People Who Collect Books, and I am so grateful to him for giving me the opportunity to do this series on Martin Luther King of eight prints that have been widely circulated and uh, are just so wonderful. Sid uh, is no longer alive, but he certainly, he was a very valuable person in my life uh, because the King uh, family had not allowed anybody to do anything with King's speech, with his uh, letter. And then I got a chance to illustrate it. And, and the <coughs> illustrations from it uh, come from his, his letter. It was a, a daunting experience. It closes with the one on slavery. He, what, he, what he's doing really is telling uh, a group of, of, uh, of ministers who said that he should not be in the Birmingham jail and if he would mind his business and go home, he wouldn't be there. And he, what he did in the letter was explain to them why he's there. Um, Hate is a Sin is also an exhibition that uh, is going to travel all over this country. It's been out mostly in the West. And uh, also a very exciting uh, project that, I've, that I have been involved in. Uh, another public work that I'm extremely uh, proud of is a 52 image mosaic uh, exhibition that is at the MTA in Los Angeles. Another very exciting, I mean I really wanted, I wanted, I wanted to do something so that when people in California, and I, I taught there for many years so I know uh, California is really not, not like any place else in this country. And I wanted people, when they come through the subway in, in, uh, in Los Angeles, I wanted them to feel like they're looking at themselves. And so I wanted to incorporate all different kinds of, of people who come through the subway in, in Los Angeles. And I used uh, various different um, creative expressions, performing and creating and Later on, you're going to see uh, sports, playing sports. And, uh, and then I ended with styling. Everybody all dressed up. If you see people looking really great in Los Angeles, because uh, they're performers, they got to look. Although not many of them are on the subway now. <laughs> I'm not going to try to <laughs> pretend they are. But uh, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> they would uh, like to think of themselves as being there. Um, this, this was a, a, a very wonderful project. I was very happy to be selected to do it. And then to go to Canada to see the, the fabrication of this project by, by a, a, a women's uh, fabrication group called Mosaica. They, they really are very good. So it was uh, enchanting. This is the, the styling one with everybody all dressed up, walking around, tipping. The Declaration of Freedom and Independence, an illustration and interpretation of the Declaration of Independence, 
was the most challenging work of art I have ever done. I just, it took me over a year just to figure out how I would approach this project. And the way I decided to do it was to put, do si I did six illustrations that have two parts each. Uh, and, the, and it is a criticism in some ways of the Declaration of Independence that, you know, women were not voting then and there was slavery in the country. And so I'm, I'm making a note of those things and showing a visual image of what the Declaration of Independence was about and women who were not voting at that time. Um, and what was actually going on in the country. The Declaration said one thing, but what was the reality was a, a lot, something different. And uh, it was, uh, I don't know, I don't think, I think there was a little problem with some of the ideas that I had with this. But uh, I, had, I had to be true to myself. So I, I did, I did what I thought made sense. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy that, that I did. The Declaration of Freedom and independence. I, I added the freedom to it because I thought it was necessary to put that individual touch to it because it's, it, these are my illustrations. I mean, anybody else could do whatever they wanted to do because we do have something very wonderful in this country. It's called freedom of speech. Sometimes the freedom, the equality is a little questionable, but the freedom of speech is pretty standard. So use it or lose it, I always say. And so in this case, I, I, did, I did use it and hadn't had it, haven't lost it yet, by the way. <laughs> This is, uh, we're getting toward the, the end of, of uh, the Declaration of Freedom. This is a fantastic picture of Frederick Douglass. And I, and I paired Thomas Jefferson with Martin Luther King right in his letter. I thought that was, you know, noteworthy that these two men wrote significant works that are definitely uh, super important in in the history of this, this country. And then I did a, um, a, a quilt of it in which I imposed the pictures. And then here comes uh, another series of um, Coming to Jones Road, part two. And I actually, in coming to Jones Road, I, I show the people coming through the the trees to freedom, and I and I use that as a way of explaining how I felt when I went to New Jersey and found out the natives didn't want me there. Uh, and and part two is showing what they looked like later, and then I also used um, some tonkas that my mother made for me a long time ago. Traits for success as an artist is uh, it's kind of like a, something to think about along with this last poster that I made called What Would America Be Like Without 400 Years of Black History? It's a hard question to answer. And you. Thank you. Thank you, Faith. I would now like 
to welcome Ellen Baxter. Ellen is the founding director of Broadway Housing Communities and has been an activist advocate of housing for the homeless in New York City for over 30 years. Ellen was a founding member of the Coalition for the Homeless in New York in the late 1970s, has published groundbreaking work on the condition of the homeless in New York City. Since then, she's been a pioneer in the creation of what is called supportive housing. If you're not familiar with this term, I think you'll start to get a feel for its meaning in the rest of this, the presentation today. It takes unusual vision, extraordinary leadership skills, profound commitment, and deep faith to do the work that Ellen does, and she has all of these. Ellen? So I uh, was proud to be invited here by Steve um, and proud to be uh, identified as an activist because that uh, term, I think, does uh, define uh, the passion of my, uh, that I have for my work. And um, it began uh, in when I first moved to New York City and found many people living on the streets. And a small group of us uh, found a lawyer just straight out of school and we went to New York State Supreme Court because in the New York State Constitution there is a phrase that reads, the government shall provide food, shelter, and clothing to the destitute. And that phrase was written into our state constitution during the Great Depression. And so we brought the stories uh, that people living in the street in photographs had told uh, us to state Supreme Court. And uh, indeed, the court ordered that the city and state of New York had the obligation to shelter every homeless man and woman uh, in the streets. Uh, Massachusetts and most other states around the country do not have that particular uh, phrase, uh, but it has governed uh, the policy in New York State and City uh, for since 1980. Um, is there a... Uh, this uh, photograph was taken in uh, 1980 and it was horrifying to me as an advocate to realize that our litigation had resulted in the barbarism of 1,450 men quartered uh, on the drill floor of the Fort Washington Armory uh, in the community where I lived. And it was the recognition of the uh, the crude tool that litigation uh, is to actually reform poverty and homelessness. So it was that experience um, and that image that really uh, drove me to establish the alternative in the community, a permanent uh, place for people to live. Homeless people needed more than just uh, a roof over their heads so they did not freeze to death, they actually needed a home and a community uh, and much more. So a, a group of us uh, established a not-for-profit organization and knocked on the doors. At that time, I didn't know what a mortgage meant. Uh, so we were a little green and yet rather persistent and put together uh, our first project and uh, showed the government that in fact homeless people and many of the original tenants of that first building came from the Fort Washington Armory. Uh, and then in, we built the second one and we got better at it and a third and a fourth. And by the time we had housed uh, a few hundred people in, in scattered buildings in West Harlem and Washington Heights, we said uh, to ourselves, you know, government has a habit of segregating people. They put homeless individuals on one side of the uh, aisle and they put homeless families somewhere else. They're funded separately and the silos of government and funding separate people. So we said we're gonna house families too, families with children. 
and not segregate homeless people uh, in individual uh, in housing where only single formerly homeless people live. So this by the t this is now the 1990s that we began to integrate families with children uh, into our housing. And by the late 1990s, we created a rather fabulous place called uh, Dorothy Day Apartments, which really demonstrated sort of the evolution of the thinking that uh, the quality of the housing needed to be high. Uh, and we met artists living in the community and invited those artists to use our walls. And we invited the neighbors from across the street uh, to participate in an after-school program that we started. So slowly, the provision of affordable housing for the poorest began to uh, uh, move us into the realm of education. And slowly, uh, we began to uh, listen to ed educators and artists. And um, the we, we created an early childhood center at Dorothy Day Apartments uh, and met uh, a fabulous ed educator here, Charlene Melville, um, who really raised the standard of my understanding of how important it is for young children to have a top-rate experience in early education. And it was not long after that that I met Faith, and she came to visit Dorothy Day Apartments because some of the children had created artwork after the September 11th tragedy. Uh, and Faith said, this is beautiful. I'll write the introduction and have it published into a book. What will, will you do for peace? And Faith came into my office that day, and she said, um, well, what are you going to do next, Ellen? And uh, we said, well, we've actually found an old garage uh, in the neighborhood where we think we can build more housing for families and we're going to build a bigger early childhood center uh, because now we know how to do it well because we have Charlene and uh, Bank Street College uh, working with us and Steve Steidel started to uh, pay attention to what was happening. And uh, Faith said, what about a children's museum of art? Uh, and storytelling too, she said. And so we said, you mean a real museum? Uh, we, we don't really know how to do that. Uh, I, know, I know where every nick, by this time of course, I knew where every nickel was in government to build affordable housing because we've done six of them. I know where I, I, I could do that in my sleep. Uh, but we did not know anything about creating a museum. And Faith was very clear. She says, we're not talking about a community center. We're talking about a true museum of art for children, Ellen. That's different than a community center where art is hung. And so we began to uh, explore, search, talk, to Steve Seidel and others, uh, museum development professionals. And we now uh, have succeeded um, in uh, assembling uh, all the money that we need to build 124 affordable apartments affordable to people at the lowest economic rung. You know, people use the word affordable housing very loosely in New York City now. Uh, I'm talking about affordable to people that are really very low income. And uh, about, I guess, in 2008, we got uh, the very wise advice uh, from experts in architecture uh, to uh, do a uh, RFP because we had never done uh, new construction before. The first six buildings were all total renovations. And so we went to Cooper Union School of Art, uh, Columbia School of Architecture, and we, we did a competition. 
and it was unanimous by that design committee that you have no choice, Ellen. The only architect you can choose to do this extraordinary project is David Adje. And so it was with the inspiration that faith uh, provided us and the power of architecture that David brought uh, that we're now about to break ground on 155th Street. And David will show you some of the, the images. Uh, but it essentially what we've learned from the beginning is that to really address deep poverty and homelessness, it requires uh, rebuilding the community and that you start with housing, the foundation of stability and permanence, quality housing at that, oak floors, uh, first class you know, accommodations, and th that housing has to be affordable. You must have access to educational opportunity. Uh, and, and, and focusing on the youngest, of course, for the children to be the center of uh, the growth of that community, it, community is important. And of course, we learned art is the vehicle that binds it together. So the Sugar Hill Project really has, has been an evolution in our thinking. We realized that we had inadvertently followed the pattern of the settlement house movement. Uh, we didn't uh, realize it until after the fact, um, but it's, uh, we did become last year uh, the newest settlement house in New York City. Uh, and it is, you know, uh, possible to do projects like this. Uh, but the truth is in New York City, uh, last, just uh, uh, last year there were 113 1,554 different men, women, and children sleeping in the city's emergency shelters. That's a lot of people. Uh, so while we can sort of demonstrate the alternative at the Sugar Hill Project, that people, people can be housed permanently, uh, children can be educated to thrive and to love to read and to love to make art, uh, there's still uh, uh, not a climate uh, at the political level that's, that's replicating this model that, that we've put together. Uh, it is uh, 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 $74 million that we've assembled to do the Sugar Hill Project. Uh, I now know what a mortgage is. Um, and and we've, we, we've, we've We've learned, though, that it is possible uh, to create the alternative. So, thank you. David Ajay is an architect and principal at Ajay Associates and is widely considered one of the most important architects in the world today. In addition to the Sugar Hill Project, David currently has architectural projects all over the world, including the design of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which is part of the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., and will be on the Mall in Washington. David has designed museums, homes, community centers, public buildings, and much more, including fantastic collaborations with artists. But as far as I know, and I forgot to ask you before I uh, came up here today, the Sugar Hill Project is his first design of an early childhood center. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Ajay. Thank you. Um, it's, it's always great when I get these two amazing women in the room because I always learn something new. <laughs> I thought um, just when you think you know everything these two amazing women, um, you learn something again and again, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be to have been involved with you for the past couple of years to make this project work. Um, I just see myself as the person who probably had the easier part. Um, I just had to make form to this extraordinary content of this history that um, Faith just outlined and this incredible 
and the vision that Alan just, and sort of uh, bravery that Alan just sort of um, outlined in this ability to just take on something that we, which is easier to just um, ignore. And I'm always just moved by that um, act by people. Um, so in a way to work with people like that for me was just so inspiring. Um, the project, as Alan described, was for um, 125 uh, sort of uh, units for low-income housing. But not only was it about that, it was about also putting in the um, early childhood um, 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 start part and also the, uh, the storytelling museum. And that, what I loved about it was that, that it offered a real um, architectural topology, which is very rare. There are models has been uh, hinted at from the sort of turn of the century, et cetera, um, which are clear, this idea of a mixed use um, housing scheme, housing which is not singular in its use, but that includes culture, includes education. Um, but to do it here and to do it in Chubby Hill Harlem was also very exciting for me. Everyone bouncing around and things are probably something just bouncing around. Um, was very um, exciting. Um, that's better. Oh yeah. <laughs> that slide, of course, in red. Um, 155th, which is the main artery that comes into the city. Um, and um, it's just me. Is it? Can you hear all that? Is that? Can I just ignore it? You can't? Can you? It's just sort of like this sort of, like as though I'm in a sort of, I think there's two microphones or, there you go. Okay, sorry. Okay, now, now you can't hear me. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll just talk. Okay. Um, this is this, this is the garage that Ellen was speaking about, which is, I mean, Ellen told me stories about this garage. Do Duke Ellington Park here? <laughs> Duke Ellington Park. I mean, that's it. Is Thurgood Marshall. <laughs> Thurgood Marshall. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, the extraordinary history of the, the people that have lived in this area that Faith was um, just outlining um, was mind blowing for me as a young um, young boy, sort of growing up in the world. Um, African American history was profound in understanding a, a sort of an, uh, another sort of black modernity that was critical to um, you know the aspirations that I had as a young kid. So half of those aspirations were based in these stories and these characters. So to work on this site and to work on in this particular area was, was very, very moving for me. I felt that I needed to go back to, in, in looking at this building, you know, some people think that it maybe comes from um, some from another place. Um, I tend to really love to work from a, what I call the archaeology of a place, and I, I tend to always um, mine the, the sort of context that I work in. So I spent a lot of time with my team photographing the, the, the neighborhood of Sugar Hill and looking at the kind of extraordinary nuances of how buildings would turn corners, how sort of bays would be made, how juxtapositions, juxtapositions would be put together. Um, and would look at certain stereotypes that people have about what they think a certain neighborhood's color palette might be. You might you know, think of them as they're all brown stone or they're all red stone, you know. And and actually realizing that the kind of using photography that you would find this incredible polyphony of color, variation, modulation, um, window kind of composition, which makes that richness that is the kind of patina that you love when you go into a neighborhood. And it's, uh, it's that entire spectrum that actually makes the richness, is what I'd argue, not necessarily a sense of what you might believe might be the refined part of it, but it's that whole composition that actually adds to it. I, uh, Sugar Hill Harlem and this idea of the upper, um, upper part of New York, this kind of sweet part of New York, was also mm -hmm. something very interesting to me. And this idea that nature and architecture were in fusion of this, as a kind of motif of this area. And just noticing be beautiful things like um, sort of crafts of the turn of the you know the turn of the century early turn of the century were sort of adding detail to every part of the sort of the sort of ma masonry part of uh, of the building, 
it's, it was something that I found really inspiring and something which, as a young architect, you know, really, uh, at the time that I grew up in, there's, a certain, there's been a certain turn away from the notion of ornament, but in a way, for my generation, ornament is no longer sort of something that's devoid from building. It's intrinsically part of the uh, emotional um, construction of a, a place, especially a place of housing. But ornament is not simply something applied, but it's something found in the process of the construction. Um, the Guarantee Building by Caliban is one of those buildings which completely becomes this incredible fusion of nature and masonry, which is a, always an inspiration, um, which leads to um, a couple of things that we became very fascinated by. Um, some loose information, um, Aretha Franklin's uh, Stone Rose, um, then concrete, sort of growing that incredible song that she sang about roses growing in concrete. And for me, that being somehow um, this superficial piece of information being a kind of beautiful metaphor for thinking about how to kind of maybe uh, find a poetry with uh, masonry and roses. So we, we worked, um, to s and how do we also link that to um, this incredible context? Um, we worked with um, digital fabrication, this is using computers, to basically work on developing a material where we could score and stamp a motif which when um, looked at uh, from a certain distance would create this image. This is a panel, um, and the panel you see on the building will stagger, um, but as you come close to it, you, you see smaller roses, and as you move away, you have larger roses. And in a way, the whole building is, is developed as a kind of form, a sort of giant rose stack, but a black rose um, which grows in the concrete. The form of the building is very simple. Um, I said that we would want to, instead of usually finding in, um, uh, in the program education elements which are deep in the plan, and you would usually have retail on the exterior, I said that I really wanted the, 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 the idea of the program of this in, uh, building was so important that the education would become the most transparent part and would support the, the residents as well. But it's the, it's the base that the, kind of the housing sits upon, and then the museum would be the second world underneath it. This would be the threshold that kind of would link those two things. The materiality is masonry and a bronze finish um, to the window, so it's, it's this deep masonry and this bronze finish. I will just quickly go through the plans for plan people on the ground floor. <laughs> it's a very simple building with a quarry in the middle, but it's basically three doors. Um, first door leads you to the education classrooms which wrap around the perimeter, which have the best views to the street. They're elevated above the street, so they're not directly eye level, but they have a relationship where the children are in these teaching <coughs> classrooms which wrap around and go internal into the school um, and have fantastic views to the city and to the context. And other people sort of in the neighborhood also have fantastic views to see children learning and, and working. And the way in which the education system is, is sort of set up that they share services, there's overlap, and you know, Charlene is here, who actually we should get up because we can't <laughs> even get back to talk to <laughs> She's so dramatic. She's been instrumental in helping us, and also um, uh, visits that we made to um, French Emilio School in, um, in Italy. It's kind of instrumental in the way in which we develop this courtyard uh, sort of strategy, which would sort of fold um, education into the center, and then sort of open up into internal courtyards, which could um, allow, um, you know, sort of uh, controlled uh, play internally, and then also, mm -hmm. this is a study just to really tell, show you what I meant by that. Really, the kind of heart, the beacon of the building is the span, which elevates and sort of divides the two forms, and is, the, is, is really the signifier of the kind of mix of this building and, and the richness of the building. Um, internally, the rooms open up into courtyards, and um, that you would see diaphanous spaces which unfold and frame each other as you sort of go around. The second uh, uh, space, partial space, is the door into the museum. Um, we, we sort of de developed the frame. We have a de um, museum um, designers who are working with us to do the, the detail of the storytelling museum. I'm not going to put that into context, but, but just to show you the outline diagram, which is that second door brings you into an entry into the museum, but some of the critical things that we 
set up with the concomitancy of entryware, history, and this stuff, but also you have this incredible relationship to the ceiling, the things that are going on up above, but also the things that are going on below. So as you enter the building, you have this extraordinary relationship as a young kid or as a teenager or as a parent to see what's going on outside, to see what's going on in, in, in sort of the foyer that you're in, but also to the conflict when you're going into sort of the basement that's never disconnected from the experience of the street and the experience of the museum. And then once you're in the museum, um, the, the main parts of the museum, which is the content, is this idea of storytelling and there's a service van where education classes wrap the exhibition paintings, which are lit with lights and frame or for views. But also you have these sort of special linkages that we've sort of been talking about to kind of allow storytelling to occur and to sort of kind of almost sort of uh, find their own spaces, find their own scale um, within the sort of size of the, the building. And then lastly, the third door, which is the center door, into the sort of uh, lobby, which takes you up into the apartment buildings. And the building is, the, the spaces are really varied. The idea is that you come into this double loaded corridor with apartments, which with each apartment having a different configuration, a different facade. We worked really hard to not make this a housing project where you just have standard cookie cutter um, sort of uh, articulation. I really wanted something which had variety, but each unit had its own specificity. And you know, the sort of maximum of that is that the corner unit for a low income personality would have this extraordinary, um, what I'm calling sort of jazz, jazz ensemble of windows, of frames to the context, um, that you would have children's windows and adult windows and windows in the sky, and there wouldn't just be two windows and a blank wall, um, which would be equally expensive. And then they would have uh, a fantastic roof garden, which would be at the top of the building would connect to the other greens that you would see only, I mean, something that you don't have in most of these housing blocks is the ability to go up onto the roof and to connect to this incredible green that's also around and in the context. So that's the project. Um, that's it on the street. That's that entrance sequence and that band is Saturday for the Black Lives Matter Day march. time I've gone to New York to the, uh, to the Dorothy Day apartments to meet with Ellen and Faith and David and Charlene and their many colleagues, amazing people, all of them. Um, I'm, each time I'm just completely moved all over and, um, and I'm moved again today and I hope you are too. Um, so, uh, I'm sure everyone here is uh, familiar with Professor Henry Louis Gates, Jr. He's the Alphonse Fletcher University Professor at Harvard University, and he's the director of the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for African and African American Research. We have been in conversation with Professor Gates for many months as we planned this event, and he asked us to schedule it when he could participate. Um, which was why we chose today. Uh, I know that he is um, seriously disappointed that last minute schedule complications made it impossible for him to be with us today. Um, he's a great admirer of uh, Bates work and of Bates' work. Um, but he did prepare remarks for this occasion and uh, Vera Grant is here uh, to share them with us in addition to her role as executive director of the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for African and African American Research. There is currently a Sheila Biddle Ford Foundation Fellow at the Institute as well, where she is completing her dissertation on modern European history at Stanford University. Vera? Hi, good evening. Hello, good evening. That's the first part of my impersonation of Skip. <laughs> you know, it's a hard my job to show up for him when he cannot be here. Uh, but I just want to tell you from the bottom of my heart, this was absolutely one of our most favorite dates of the year. And he is really, really brokenhearted not to be here. 
So I'll just go right into his remarks because they touched on so many things that uh, were said today. Um, but first, I just want to say, is that amazing? <laughs> is that just amazing? Oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, I, I grew up in what's called Little Harlem in South Jamaica and went to City College, which is known as the Poor Man's Harvard. So I am personally delighted to be here. So from Skip, I am so very sorry that I cannot be with you this evening to celebrate the Sugar Hill Project, which will be a remarkable achievement in art, architecture, and activism. I am deeply grateful to the Astra Forum for organizing this discussion and inviting me to participate. I marvel at what David Ajay, Ellen Baxter, and Faith Ringgold, and their many, many partners are doing in the Sugar Hill Project. They are building storytelling, reading, art, and education into the very environment of this community. Amazing. As you all know, Sugar Hill in Harlem has the richest of histories it was the epicenter of the Harlem Renaissance, the flourishing of the new Negro art and literature of the 1920s and 1930s. Harlem was a physical home and spiritual home to W.E.B. Du Bois, my hero, and to Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, James Weldon Johnson, Elaine Locke, Jesse Fawcett, Jean Toomer, Claude McKay, to name just a few. Brilliance can grow in isolation, of course, but it finds its nurturance so much more readily in a sustaining and inspiring community. Would Zora Neale Hurston have written, Their Eyes Were Watching God, had she stayed in Eatonville, Florida? Could Langston Hughes even have written Harlem, What Happens to a Dream Deferred, had he stayed in Kansas? Possibly. But there may have been no community to guide them out into the light to recognize their resonance and their brilliance. This is what Harlem was to black artists in those decades. And even during its hardest times, the idea of it as a community that supports and fosters growth and development remained. The Sugar Hill Project promises to restore Harlem to its historic place as nurturer and sustainer of thought, productivity, and even genius. So I've spent my career studying the writing of African Americans. For our ancestors who were slaves, the withholding of literacy was one of the most potent means slave owners had to keep them as chattel, to dehumanize them. And this is the reason that every slave narrative has at its center the moment at which literacy was attained. Reaching through subterfuge and a flouting of the law, literacy was the surest means we had to claim our own humanity and to give voice to it. I often view the slave narrative as a seed out of which the Harlem Renaissance, its lovely flowers, grew. And to carry this metaphor just a bit further, <coughs> remember I am all about roots the history of African Americans and other people of color in the United States, the history of their struggles and their monumental successes, provide the fertile ground out of which grows the Sugar Hill Project. It brings the expressive possibilities of the arts into the living, breathing home that Harlem has always been. Life and stories and art will come together in this one historic place, Sugar Hill. I cannot wait to be there. Please thank Professor Gates for those comments. Uh, we have a few minutes that in which we could entertain some questions if people have any or comments and thoughts. Um, thank you. Can you, uh, can you stand and just say your name and. Why don't you, and then Faith, if you want to add anything about your vision. Uh, well, 
you know, there's been a, a dramatic growth in the industry of children's museums nationally and internationally. Uh, so uh, the oldest children's museum uh, in, is in New York City, the Brooklyn Children's Museum. Uh, but there's been a proliferation of museums. And in some cases, those museums are indoor play spaces, wonderful indoor play spaces. Uh, but they're not uh, places for children to create art, understand art, experience art, and have be motivated uh, to uh, uh, participate in the creative process. And so we've worked to design a space that will both uh, exhibit art and uh, art making studio spaces, an artist in residence studio, uh, a library for storytelling. And the concept is that the storytelling and art uh, will be integral. There's not a separate place for the storytelling. As, as space work has shown us, you know, art making has a story behind it. And for children, it's all connected. Uh, and Steve's participation with us uh, help us to better understand the experience at the Reggio Emilia schools uh, and how art helps uh, that community to bind together and see children as the, as the centerpiece of their community, that all the elements of the community stand behind uh, the education of the, those children. And the, 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 so it's, it's an effort to create a new form of museum uh, that is, uh, so we can't describe it exactly yet. Uh, we know that uh, Steve has told us from the very first day he met us, he says, you be sure an arts educator is a decision maker there. Uh, you know, because you're aware of sort of the balance between the curatorial decision makers and the art educators here in this audience. and. And I think it's uh, for a children's museum of art and storytelling an art educator will, will need to be at the helm. We don't have that director yet uh, to help guide the um, curatorial decision making. We're, that person will be uh, we're just beginning that search. Uh, please go to our website uh, and you'll, for people that are interested in, in sort of uh, pursuing that, you know, opportunity. Uh, and, you know, Sugar Hill is a community where 72% of the children are born into poor families. So it is a bit of a challenge to be creating a new cultural institution in this economic climate uh, on St. Nicholas Avenue and 155th Street. It's not downtown. And so we have somehow managed to uh, rustle up all the capital to build it, though. And it's just been a creative way of sharing our knowledge with raising capital to build affordable housing by putting it underneath the housing. That housing is helping to construct the museum walls, the exterior walls, and then we uh, there's this form of, we affectionately call it corporate welfare, that allows uh, corporations to invest in low-income communities. And so we use the Federal Low-Income Housing Tax Credit Program, be, builds the housing, and the New Market Tax Credit Program builds the museum. Uh, and generally, people use the new markets to build CVS, you know, that's why you see so many CVSs in near affordable housing. Uh, but in our case, we used exactly the same money to create cultural space. And that's one of the reasons why I think Sugar Hill is important is because it's blending public, private, philanthropic money in a way that's serving the common good in a, in a more equitable fashion, and it's addressing multiple layers of that 
community. And it's doing so in a cost-effective way, in a way that taxpayers and uh, uh, rational people s should support. So it's not a far-flung, you know, uh, ragtag operation. You know, it, it's able to leverage the money and it could be a model for urban centers uh, across the country. The, 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 the museum component is still, it's a work in progress, uh, but what we're striving to do is uh, not uh, for it to be place to allow children to shine and not to give them prescribed ways of so much in children's museum instead of pushing buttons and watching the ball go down, and, uh, but rather the opportunities to, to be creative in their own ways. Um, I wonder if it might make sense, um, Faith, you shared in your comments today uh, some about the integration of visual is in storytelling in your own work. But when I first met you, part of the conversation that we had was about your sense of the role of stories in children's lives, both as they listen, but also as they construct their world. Would you want to share a little bit about that right now? Children are really great artists and storytellers. They do both extremely well. They, they start off scribbling pre-kindergarten, and then they kind of get a, um, a form. It's usually kind of circular. It represents the body. They're trying to recreate themselves. And then they have extensions coming off this body, which is arms and legs and stuff. And it, it, But it's not abstract. Don't get confused. This is the real thing in their mind. And uh, as long as we don't tell them that it's not and have them try to copy something else, they will develop their own way, and it is miraculous to watch them do it. I had a high school license, art license, but I, in the 60s, I got an opportunity through the UFT, United Federation of Teachers, to go and teach in an elementary school with little kids. And I used to steal into the pre-kindergarten classrooms because the principal didn't want us in there, the specialists, because there were a whole bunch of specialists in art and music and reading and all, and, and they didn't want us going in messing with the pre-kindergarten kids because they thought that we would stimulate them too much. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so we used to sneak in, and, and one, one day we sneaked in, and uh, the music teacher was playing Peter and the Wolf and the principal was coming down the hall and the teacher said, and we ran out the back door, <laughs> the music teacher and me ran out the back door and when we came back in, after the principal had gone, we didn't see any children in the room. And he said, oh my God, where are the kids? Well, I looked closely and I saw some little eyes peering from underneath their tables, they had all ran underneath the table because they were being taught how to, in case a, a bomb hit or something was during that time, you know, when the kids were being taught how to protect themselves. So they had heard Peter and the wolf, you know, that and they got scared. And they, they, when they saw us run, they thought <laughs> maybe there was something to be afraid of. And kids love to be frightened in school, at home, where they've got their parents and people who love and protect them. That's where they really like to be scared, real scared. And uh, so I knew that. And so we got them from underneath the tables and stuff. And they came up, you know, smiling and everything. And uh, 
Okay, so the music was finished. And so I said, okay, now we're gonna do a picture about being lost. How, how many of you have ever been lost? Every hand went up. So I said, well, you know, maybe we could tell something about that. Who'd like to tell what that experience was like? So this, this little boy got up and he said, I was lost, I was coming through the forest and I was going to my grandmother's house. <laughs> And when I got there, the wolf, and I said, oh, stop it. I can't believe this. Every kid in that room was sitting on the edge of their seat. I thought they would say, oh, look, we've heard that you, that's not your story. They loved it. It was safe. It was scary. They knew the end of it. It was perfect. <laughs> That's little kids, they love that. So I'm just so glad I had an opportunity to, to see them and know that little, and it's not just some children, it's not just the kids in Harlem or the kids who live downtown, it's all the kids. Everywhere in the world, kids embrace picture making and storytelling if they get the opportunity and that's our job, to make sure they get the opportunity to express their creativity, not only in art, but music and so on, while they still have the passion growing within them. Because it does go away for a lot of kids. About eight, nine, it starts to disappear. By the time you get to junior high school, it's going, going. By the time high school, they're already finished. Most of them, except those who are going to become artists, they stay on. So that's that's what I know. So thank you. Okay, I I, I do wish we had time for uh, many more questions and much more conversation, but um, but we need to adjourn shortly. Um, before we adjourn, this is a special occasion on top of the specialness of just having this presentation. Um, and it's my great privilege to preside at the presentation of an award. The Thelma E. Goldberg Award for Excellence in the Arts and Education was established in 2006 by Dr. Ray Goldberg in honor of his wife Thelma on the occasion of their 50th wedding anniversary. Thelma, a longtime advocate and supporter of both the arts and education, but with a special interest in music education, has also been a longtime member of the Advisory Council for the Arts and Education Program <coughs> here at the School of Education. Together, Thelma and Ray have made wonderful and highly valued contributions to this field, and we treasure their friendship, their integrity, their commitment to those working at the intersection of the arts and learning. And we are very delighted that they are he here with us today, and I'd like them to just wave and let us know. <laughs> there are many outstanding artists who make important commitments to share their knowledge, craft, and artistry with younger people. <coughs> Fewer, however, make lifelong and profound commitments to excellence in both realms, their artistic practice and their educational practice. It is the goal of this award to identify and honor artists who have made these commitments. Two years ago, we were honored to present this award for the very first time to Yo-Yo Ma and the Silk Road Project. It is my honor today to present the Thelma E. Goldberg Award for the second time, this time to Faith Ringgold. <laughs> Ms. Ringgold, with her lifetime of distinguished work in both the arts and education, is an ideal recipient for this award. Born in Harlem in 1930 as a child, her mother taught her how to sew, and her great great grandmother taught her the art of quilt making, which she had learned from her own mother, a slave who had made quilts for her white masters. As she has described, she also spent her childhood 
listening to the stories of her elders and all of the adults who passed through her family's apartment. She has many stories about those stories and surely they had a profound influence on her understanding of where she came from and where she wanted to go. One of the places she wanted to go was to college. Ms. Ringgold graduated from the City College of New York with a degree in painting and then began her remarkable career as both an artist and an educator. She's known for her activist paintings of the 1960s and 70s, which you've seen, as well as for her painted story quilts in which she fuses painting, quilted fabric, and storytelling into one medium. In the realm of education, Faith taught art in New York public schools for almost 20 years. In addition, after that, she is Professor Emeritus at the University of California, San Diego, where she taught art from 1984 to 2002. Her work has been exhibited in major museums around the world and is included in the permanent collections of many museums, including the Studio Museum of Harlem, the Guggenheim Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Mo Museum of Modern Art. Faith was one of the first women artists to protest the discrimination against people of color and women in art museums and advocated intensely until changes were made in New York and beyond. In 1991, Faith began publishing children's books. Her first book, Tar Beach, received the New York Times Best Children's Book Award, the Caldecott Honor, and the Coretta Scott King Award. She has since written and illustrated 17 children's books. She founded and chairs the Anyone Can Fly Foundation, a nonprofit organization whose mission is, quote, to expand the art establishment's canon, to include artists of the African diaspora, and to introduce the great masters of African American art and their art traditions to kids as well as adult audiences. In addition, as you've heard today, Faith's artistic work, her educational ideas, and her work with children in Harlem has been the critical inspiration for the creation of the new Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling. Surely, Faith has lived a remarkable and inspiring life with extraordinary contributions in two realms that explore what is most promising, hopeful, and profound in human experience, the arts and education. Please join me in honoring Faith Ringgold with the Thelma E. Goldberg Award for Excellence in Art. <laughs>